Good morning. A lot to get to. I'm Stephen Romo. And I'm Valerie Castro. Joe and Savannah are on assignment. From Georgia to Washington, we have full team coverage of the fallout. And we begin with NBC's Garrett Haight in Atlanta and NBC News legal an analyst Danny Savalos. Garrett, let's start with you. Walk us through this latest indictment facing the former president and some of the other key defendants that are charged alongside him. Yeah, look, I think the word of the day will be sprawling, as that's the best way to describe this indictment. Nearly 100 pages, 41 counts, 19 people, including the former president, charged, and another 30 or so unindicted co-conspirators mentioned. This indictment reaches all the way back into 2020 and sort of lays out methodically, act by act, the ways in which the prosecutors believe these people went from speech about the election, which is what Donald Trump has always said he was doing, to actions, criminal actions, they say, to undermine it. Here's what Fannie Willis told reporters about the decision to file these charges and what they mean last night. Specifically, the participants in association took various actions in Georgia and elsewhere to block the counting of the votes of the presidential electors who were certified as the winners of Georgia's 2020 general election. Rather than by, abide by Georgia's legal process for election challenges, the defendants engaged in a criminal racketeering enterprise to overturn Georgia's presidential election result. Now, among the other defendants referred to there by the district attorney are Rudy Giuliani, who was serving as the president's lawyer, and really the face of the Stop the Steal movement around the end of 2020, early 2021. Also, his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, who worked as kind of a consigliere for Donald Trump at that time, trying to connect him with Georgia officials who the indictment accuses him of then trying to pressure to come up with votes to overturn the election. Uh, also, John Eastman, attorney who would be a familiar name to folks who followed the January 6th committee's work, really the architect of the effort to pressure Mike Pence to throw out electoral votes on January 6th. That's really just the tip of the iceberg in this indictment, which I think uh, reporters and attorneys for these various defendants and co-conspirators will be studying for days to come, guys. So we have those figures along with some uh, Georgia officials as well. Denny, let's bring you in here. Which of these charges stand out to you? I know it can be easy to get lost with yet another indictment. So what is standing out to you in this Georgia indictment? And there is a lot of complicated uh, legal theories in this indictment. You have a lot of conspiracy, a lot of attempt. That is what we call inchoate law. It, it means that it's a an incomplete crime that you can still charge. For example, just because you're not successful robbing the bank doesn't mean that you can't be charged for robbing the bank. So you see a lot of inchoate crimes here. But of course, the one that stands out the most is one that everyone expected, which is Georgia's RICO statute. Broader in scope than its federal counterpart, it gives prosecutors a lot of tools and it carries with it a five-year mandatory minimum. It's not the only mandatory minimum in this case. Some of these other charges uh, could, can, could uh, carry one-year mandatory minimums. And by the way, if you start consecutiving those sentences, running them end to end to end, uh, mandatory minimums can add up and you can get to five years uh, any other way by simply having consecutive sentences. So I guess the RICO statute is probably the most significant because it allows the state to prove not only these predicate crimes and charge them separately, but to bring those all in under a RICO uh, charge, which requires them to prove a common enterprise. Uh, but that shouldn't be too difficult because, as they allege, it's basically the campaign. That was the enterprise. Garrett, let's get back out to you. What has the response been from Trump and his legal team to this indictment? Yeah, there has been both a legal and a political response. The Trump legal team put out a statement last night saying that this was a one-sided case. Of course, that's always true with the grand jury presentation. There's never going to be defense attorneys in the room. But they question whether this is even a constitutional prosecution. That's been kind of the argument from the Trump team on the legal and political sides as well, that this is all about First Amendment protected speech, that the president was well within his rights at the time to try to argue that the election was stolen and do everything he could politically uh, to defend defend his opportunity to continue to serve as president. That's the legal argument, at least as his attorneys have framed it so far. Politically, Donald Trump and his team have really been hammering on the timing of this indictment. They believe, or at least
case, they say, that this is a case that could have been brought two and a half years ago or at any time since, and that it's being brought now specifically to damage his reelection chances. They say it's all political. They point out that Fonnie Willis is a democratically elected DA. She's a member of the Democratic Party. They say, basically, she's out to get us. Whether that works politically any better than it works legally will be an open question. And Danny, unlike the federal case, Bonnie Willis is saying that she wants to try all 19 defendants, including the former president, together. Quickly here, what is the significance of that decision? The main significance to me is that this trial is not going forward, not even in 2024. I would even say 2025 is a possibility. By adding all those defendants, it's ambitious. Uh, to that extent, you know, Fonnie Willis could be uh, praised. But on the other hand, even she must know that having every one of those defendants you see there in those pictures, every one of them can file a motion to sever, a motion to continue, a motion for this. Some of them, you know, may even have, uh, may even require uh, uh, court-appointed counsel. Then you have to file a motion anytime you want an expert. These are all things that could add to the length of time. And keep in mind, right now in Fulton County, there is a trial uh, that is underway with a high profile, obviously not as high profile defendant, but it is a racketeering charge. It's been in jury selection, Stephen, jury selection for eight months. Jury selection. Incredible. Not a single witness called yet. So that's the state of affairs in, in uh, Fulton County. Danny, we always appreciate your insight. Thank you. Garrett, also thank you so much for reporting from Georgia. And now let's bring in NBC News at Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles. He's been tracking reaction from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle about this this morning. Ryan, thanks for being here. So Congress, of course, currently in recess, but that has not stopped some lawmakers from posting their reactions on social media. So what reaction are you seeing? Yeah, that's right, Stephen. And what's amazing uh, is that uh, these members of Congress are getting used to this. This is a process that they've had to deal with now for a fourth time. Uh, and the reactions are really split amongst Republicans and Democrats, as you might imagine. Uh, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, of course, one of President Trump's uh, biggest defenders, went right to Twitter, or X as it's called now, last night, saying that justice should be blind, and then accused the Biden administration of weaponizing government against his leading political opponent uh, to interfere in the 2024 election. Now he's attacking uh, the radical, as he calls it, district attorney in Georgia, who is a Democrat, for doing what he claims is the same thing. On the other side of the aisle, though, you see Democrats, particularly the two Democratic leaders, uh, Hakeem Jeffries and Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, putting out a statement saying that this is an example uh, of how Donald Trump led a months-long plot pushing the big lie to steal an election and undermine our democracy. Uh, so they are uh, clearly supporting the effort here uh, by the district attorney and are asking that the uh, legal process play itself out, Stephen. So Ryan, after the New York indictment and then the federal indictment, it took quite a while for some lawmakers to actually release statements. Uh, what's different this time around? Well, they're used to it, right? <laughs> Which is kind of crazy to think that a leading presidential candidate could find uh, himself in so much legal turmoil that his both uh, supporters and detractors are quick with their responses to these things. And there really isn't anything unique about what we're seeing uh, from these responses. Republicans, by and large, claim that this is an overreach by a prosecutor who has a political motivation, a Democrat saying that this is just part of the judicial process and that no one is above the law. So it is something they're accustomed to. This isn't a big surprise the way we're seeing them react. Uh, and we'll have to see if that continues when they come back from session here in a couple of weeks. And Ryan, we can't forget this is happening with the presidential election in the background. So not just Democratic rivals, but these primary rivals as well. Quickly, what can you tell us? What are the other uh, Republican candidates saying? Well, by and large, the Republican candidates continue to support Donald Trump in terms of the legal problems that he's dealing. But not all of them are in that camp. For instance, uh, former Governor Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas, he put out a statement last night uh, that where he says that this is clear that this is something that disqualifies Donald Trump uh, from becoming the Republican nominee this time around. But then others like Vivek Rasenswamy, uh, a Republican candidate, uh, attacking this process uh, and saying that this is a judicial overreach and that they are politicized persecution. So by and large, Republicans supporting the former president, but we do see a few outliers here and there. Certainly more reaction to come. Ryan Nobles, thank you. Let's bring in NBC News digital senior national politics reporter John Allen for more on the fallout of this indictment. John, good morning. We know some of the people charged in this indictment include members of Trump's White House staff and his administration's Justice Department. How could that complicate the investigations and potential trials? Well, I think there are a lot of ways that that could complicate uh, the investigation and trials, uh, you know, to uh, to a point that was just made earlier. I mean, the, 
the opportunity for delay, Danny Savalas was making, the opportunity for delay with all these folks, with all the motions that they could file, the, uh, you know, uh, ad nauseum um, <laughs> uh, could could complicate the trial. But uh, there are other uh, pieces here as well that, that could complicate things um, as far as the people that are closest to Trump. Uh, presumably, um, you know, what you're seeing with all these people who are named uh, is going to be an effort by the uh, by the Georgia uh, Georgia law um, law enforcement, the Georgia prosecutors, to uh, to get some of those folks to flip um, during this trial. John, this is of course the fourth time the former president and current presidential candidate has been indicted. What impact, if any, could those previous indictments have on his candidacy? Um, you know, there's some thought that the uh, that the first. Uh, indictment in New York acted as a, a little bit of a vaccine, an immunizer for uh, Donald Trump, because it, it pushed uh, Republicans to rally around the flag, to rally around Trump uh, in the primary. And what we've seen over the course of time is that that's what's happened. Um, I, you know, whether that it's helpful for him in a general election, I think, is uh, still completely up for debate. And also the question of whether there is a point at which uh, there is a straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, you know, I think it remains uh, in doubt because, you know, none of us have a crystal ball. Uh, but these indictments uh, are uh, certainly political baggage at the very least. And um, that concerns some, Repub some, but not all, Republican voters in terms of uh, whether Donald Trump could be viable in a general election. And John, has he indicated if this could impact his campaign schedule? Does he plan to attend that first Republican presidential debate next week? That's still up in the air. Trump has uh, <laughs> Trump is being advised uh, by people around him not to go because he's up uh, in the polls so much, and I think they don't see real upside for him in going on a debate stage with people he's well ahead of. And at the same time, uh, he clearly has some uh, sort of gut instinct to want to go. He asks his crowds at all of his rallies whether he should go or not, um, and so he's teasing that out as much as possible. I guess we'll just have to wait for the debate to find out. All right, yep, we'll have to wait and see. John Allen, thank you so much. Turning now to the latest on those devastating wildfires continuing to ravage the state of Hawaii. One week after the fires started, at least 99 people are confirmed dead, and search and rescue crews, along with cadaver dogs, are continuing to look for more victims. Today, police in Maui are expected to begin releasing the names of those killed, and there are now growing questions this morning about Hawaii's preparedness for tackling these wildfires. Hawaii's Governor Josh Green says there are multiple reviews underway to assess the state's readiness. He also highlights how the community has come together during this tragedy. The recovery from this tragedy is proceeding, and it's proceeding extremely vigorously. As you know, the tragedy occurred on the 8th uh, late. Immediately, we asked for support, and the world has stepped up. Our communities have stepped up. Meanwhile, take a look at some of this cell phone video of condos burning last week in Lahaina. Two people were able to escape those flames by jumping into a pool at the complex there. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson joins us now from Maui with the latest on this. Good morning, Steve. Thanks for being here. So what's the latest on the ground where you are? Hey, good morning, Stephen. You know, this search and rescue effort is incredibly grueling. It will take a very long time. And, and a lot that has to do with this death toll is going to be heartbreaking for a lot of people because you've got a search area that is only about 25% completed of that. We now know that just under 100 people have been confirmed dead. Uh, but you factor in the fact that they've brought in more cadaver dogs. They've brought in more search teams. They are expanding that search area. They're doing all they can to get recognition from the people that are missing. But again, 25% of that area, all, still 1,300 people are missing. And it has been several days days now where these people have had internet access and cell phone access and power and water. And so the estimation is that that number would precipitously fall as people were being found, maybe at local shelters or sleeping at their car or at a random person's place or at a friend's house. But that is not happening. And so the expectation is over the next few days, over the next few weeks, that that death toll will continue to increase. The governor estimates now that over the next 10 days, there could be another 10 to 20 confirmed deaths. Meanwhile, police, yes, are ready to start identifying some of the folks that they are finding, but even that is slow. DNA matching has to be a very particular process because 
of that number of dead, only about 3% of the bodies, of the remains, have had fingerprints. So it is mm. very slow, it is very grueling. On the other side of this, there is a huge humanitarian crisis. People need housing, people need food, people need shelter, people need water, people need fuel. Uh, and so finding those resources is proving difficult for a lot of folks. I just spoke to a, a manager from FEMA who says that they are helping with that effort, that there is more on the way, and that they're doing the best they can to connect people to a place to stay. Stevens. So disheartening to hear that number of missing that continues, Steve. Also, people starting to ask questions about preparedness here, Hawaii's level of preparedness to take on those wildfires. What are officials saying about that? Yeah, officials are concerned about the long-term scope of this and what happened in the short term. The short term has been talked about a lot, right? Those sirens didn't go off. Hawaii has one of the most sophisticated, integrated outdoor siren systems in the world. There are 400 spread, spread out around this entire island chain, 80 right here in Maui alone, and those did not occur during this fire. There's also questions about where some of these emergency managers were, where the fire chief was, when the fire broke out. People were contacted, according to the government, by text, by television, by radio alerts. But why wasn't it factored in that people were out of power before then? I think there's a lot of questions about what happened during the fire. But there's also long-term questions about uh, Hawaii's sort of estimation of how dangerous wildfires would be. There was a rating of disasters that could affect people on the island of Maui. Fires were very low on that list. Not to mention, of course, finding resources, connecting people, the, the way the county is handling access and getting supplies into folks that are still on the ground that still need help. Uh, we spoke to some officials in charge of this, including one senator. Here's what they're saying about preparedness. Listen to this. There has not been a single request to the federal government that has not been granted. The federal family was immediately on the ground within six hours of submittal. The disaster, major disaster declaration was declared. The American Red Cross volunteers and staff have been on the ground working around the clock to make sure folks have their immediate needs met. And those are the priorities we're focusing on. Things like food, water, shelter. We're connecting with medical services, making sure they have disaster mental health care. Um, and we want to continue to focus on those things. They certainly are helping, but I, I've spoken to several residents, people who are in shelters, people who are helping people who are in shelters, people who've lost people inside that zone. And they say that the support has been incredibly slow. And maybe it has to be because of, all, again, of how grueling that search is. Um, but I think more work needs to be done both on the federal and state level to get help to people who need it most. Stephen. A lot of need, very important to highlight. Steve Patterson, thanks so much. Rob Gooday joins us now. He's the CEO, founder, and director of the Cajun Navy Ground Force. They've been on the ground. They're helping out in Maui. Rob, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, start off by telling us a, a little bit about your organization, what you all do, and how this all got started. Uh, our organization uh, provides swift response after natural disasters. Um, we seek uh, to help you know, the vulnerable and individuals, elderly and disabled individuals who have a harder time um, accessing help and immediately, and we come in and help them very quickly. Yeah, I know you guys were on the ground last year during the hurricane as well. You respond to so many of these natural disasters. I'm sure you've seen so much devastation over the years. Tell us, what is it like in Maui for those of us who aren't there, and just how bad is the situation that you're seeing there? Yeah, you know, it, it's an interesting geographical layout. Unless you're here and you see it, you know, they call it the west end, the west side of the island where the fires happen. It's Lahaina is the city, and, you know, it's a very uh, it's a very uh, sacred place before the fires. And that, where the airport is is a much larger city. It's a completely operating city. There were no fires there. You know, Walmart is open and Target is open, and all of the big stores are open there. And it's only, you know, um, 45 minutes away. Um, if you drive through the south side, there's another route through the north side that's a much, much longer drive, um, probably an hour and a half to two hours. Um, that's easier, actually easier to get through because there's no, there are no police roadblocks. And that's, we actually drove into Lahaina for the first time yesterday. Um, and, you know, to, to go and, and begin to evaluate how we can help. Um, there's a coordinated effort um, through VOAD, which is Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster. Um, we we travel, 
you know, through to many states doing disaster response and, and many other disaster nonprofits do as well. And VOAD provides a vehicle for us to communicate and collaborate. It's uh, loosely organized by, by FEMA as well, uh, the VOAD is. Rob, good day. We know organizations like yours are so much needed in disaster situations like this. We so appreciate you taking time out of your day to speak with us. Thank you. Mm. The video yes, of that Thank destruction, you. so hard to look at. We appreciate that, Rob. Meanwhile, the Pacific Basin still very active with not one, but two tropical systems expected to pass near Hawaii in the coming days. So for more on that, let's turn to your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us now. Hi, Angie. Hi there, guys. Good morning. We've got a couple of spots that we're keeping a close eye on. We have two named systems, and we have one more that could form here and become a depression here in the in the coming days. That's this area right here right now, 80% chance. But when we're talking about impacts to Hawaii with these two systems, we're mainly going to be dealing with uh, them sitting to the south. No direct impacts for the island. You can see those paths of both Hurricane Fernanda, which will by that time weaken significantly from the Category 2 hurricane that it is now down the line by the time it gets even to the south of Hawaii, it'll be uh, just a remnant low. When we look at Tropical Storm Greg, we're talking similar story, still to the south, going to pass well to the south of, of Hawaii. But uh, the difference of that low pressure system and a high pressure system to the north of Hawaii could bring those trade winds up just a little bit. We're talking about not the significant winds that they dealt with last week when this fire spread so quickly, but more so breezy conditions, 10, 15, 20, 25 mile per hour winds. Of course, not great when you're fighting fires either way, but not the significant winds of 50 plus miles per hour that they saw last week. So that's the setup when it comes to uh, those system systems in the Pacific at this time. Meanwhile, we woke up to very soggy conditions across parts of the Midwest and the Northeast. We've got 12 12 million people under flood alerts. This number has significantly dropped since this morning, but we still have some rain working through and we likely still have some ponding on the roadways after significant rainfall overnight and into the early morning hours. So just take it slow in some of these roads across the Northeast, across the Midwest, still heavy rain happening through the state of Michigan and up into parts of New England. And that's going to stay with us at least for a little while longer. By the time we get into the afternoon hours, it'll be more so the South and the Mid-Atlantic that we'll look to for impacts when it comes to strong storms as well as flooding. As we get into tomorrow, that front becomes stationary and it just sticks around and keeps us quite unsettled here through your Wednesday. This will be something we look at through the midweek and you can see those rainfall amounts are pretty significant in some spots, one to two inches, but upwards of three inches possible as far as the rain is concerned. And not to mention uh, the flooding concern is really going to be focused towards parts of the mid-Atlantic with those two hour or two inch per hour rainfall rates. So some significant rain falling across the next a couple of days. And not to mention, we also have uh, 7 million people at risk for some strong storms. The hazards include those strong wind gusts, 60 miles per hour or higher, the hail, but of course we can't rule out a tornado too. And it does include places like Rally, Norfolk, up extending into New York, Atlantic City, Washington, D.C. More general thunderstorms for the folks there, but still worth t paying attention to this afternoon. Wow, so much going on. A lot, for and sure. Thanks for bringing it down for us, Andrew. Yes. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.